Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Welcome to this Resolution Foundation uh, and Money Macro and Finance Society joint webinar. My name is Torsten Bell. I'm the Chief Executive of the Resolution Foundation. Now, this webinar is part of a series focused on some of the big picture questions that we need to be thinking about uh, when we talk about the recovery from this pandemic. Yesterday, we were talking about productivity with a great session with John Van Rienen and Diane uh, coil, but today we're talking about the nature of structural change that has happened during this crisis and how much of that will turn out to be actually structural as we come out of it and what that means for our economies and actually for our societies as well. So that's a nice small topic to get covered in an hour uh, and a quarter. Now to help us do that, we're going to hear from two great speakers. First of all, you're going to hear from Raghu Rajan, who is a professor of finance at the University of Chicago, but was previously governor of the Reserve Bank of India and uh, the chief economist at the International Monetary Fund. And then after him, you're going to hear from Jan Eberly, who is professor of finance at Northwestern uh, University and previously has had a number of roles at the US uh, Treasury. So we've got two great speakers. As always, you can engage in the conversation on Slido. The hashtag is structural change if you log on there. And as well as asking questions, that's the place to vote on the, some of the polls we're going to be sharing during the course of this uh, seminar. And before we hear from our speakers, I should also plug that next Tuesday, the next seminar in this series is focused on the very popular topic these days of where next for fiscal policy. The, um, uh, and at that seminar, you can hear from Joe Stignitz and from uh, Elga Bark. So yeah, as I say, 2.30 uh, GMT on um, Tuesday. So that is the plan. So you're going to hit you can hit two presentations first, and then we'll have around 30 to 40 minutes for questions afterwards. So to kick us off, over to you, Raghu. Great. Uh, let me share my screen. And uh, please holler if you can't see it. Okay. You can see it perfectly. Great. So uh, what I want to talk about is, uh, is really uh, what I think uh, is needed, uh, both pre-pandemic and even more as a result of the pandemic, uh, in terms of uh, the focus of uh, many of our policies. And to some extent, uh, this is going to uh, be at a 30,000 or 300,000 uh, foot high view of what is needed. Uh, we can go to some specifics later, uh, but uh, 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 when when Jan presents, uh, I think we'll try and link up some of these uh, these ideas. So let me start with uh, with uh, you know uh, uh, first uh, uh, thanking Resolution for inviting me, but. Also saying that, uh, you know, much of the debate uh, over markets uh, and governments uh, have really been how much of each. And of course, uh, at Chicago, we believe in free and competitive markets. And uh, certainly there is a, a side of Chicago which emphasizes very, very limited government, the night watchman state to enforce contracts and property rights, and not very much more. In practice, both governments and markets have fed on each other and grown together. If you look at the size of governments in industrial countries, uh, significantly larger as a fraction of GDP than, for example, governments in developing countries. And, and that has been reinforced by the government action during the pandemic. But uh, these views of uh, one versus the other, rather than seeing them as, uh, as sort of... Uh, um, uh, sort of forces that, uh, that uh, in a sense, gain strength from each other, neglects the third pillar, which is the community, uh, which uh, uh, if you think of the government as a political side, you think of the markets as the economic side, the community is a social side, which uh, both directly uh, and through democracy makes markets and the state uh, a work for the many. And, and when uh, these uh, work for the many, the many support the system. And what we've seen over the last few years is the many don't support the system any longer. And I will argue it is often because their communities, in fact, are breaking down. And, and this is because of that very important force that we all uh, know matters, uh, you know, certainly since the work of Karl Marx, uh, which is technology. Technological change has hit us uh, in very subtle ways sometimes, uh, in, in frontal ways uh, at other times, as, for example, during the pandemic. And, uh, 
you know, it has uh, it has changed our economic lives. Certainly, it has facilitated trade. Uh, the cost of trade has come down significantly. Uh, you know, through uh, simple factors like the container, uh, which has reduced logistic costs tremendously, uh, but also. Uh, information and communications technology, you know what is happening in your factory in Thailand on a minute by minute basis, which is essential to have a properly functioning global supply chain. And so as a result, uh, what you've, you've got today is the ability to produce anywhere, anytime, interrupted only by political disruptions between countries and the occasional uh, you know, uh, cyclone or, or, or um, hurricane. But otherwise, we have global supply chains which work very, very effectively. And, and what this has done is taken, as you well know, uh, much work that used to happen in uh, um, in industrial countries back into emerging markets, especially on the manufacturing side. So uh, uh, the work uh, that we've seen of uh, of people uh, uh, like like Otor and 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 Gorn shows that. Uh, a number of uh, of small towns, which used to be the focus of something like, say, the furniture industry in the United States, uh, have essentially uh, lost all economic activity. Uh, there, and and as a result, the communities surrounding those towns have become deindustrialized, but also have broken down as a result. We'll come to that in a second. A second uh, uh, factor, and probably the more important factor, as you know, uh, uh, that economists cite is that uh, outsourcing and automation have also hollowed out the middle. Uh, basically, uh, think of the tax accountant who used to benefit from knowing every last detail of the tax code. Uh, now she is replaced by TurboTax and a high school grad who knows how to operate TurboTax on her computer and can offer computing services, uh, can offer tax services through H&R Block through, to a wide variety of people. Customers benefit, but the jobs are gone. So if you look across industrial countries, research suggests that middle income jobs have disappeared, the hollowing out of the middle, while uh, jobs at the low end as well as the high end have increased. Of course, the big question is how do you get from the low end to the high end? And then again and again, the answer is education. Uh, education right through, not just education at the university level, but a good solid preparation when you're a child, uh, combined with a good schooling and, of course, a good finishing, uh, hopefully in an Ivy League university uh, or a strong university. And that's that's the ticket to a fantastic job today. So that's on the economic side. You've got uh, a hollowing out of the middle plus an increase in requirements for people in terms of what they need to do. Similarly, and this is the uh, the way the state and markets feed on each other, as markets have become more integrated, governance powers have migrated up. Because in a sense, uh, the ideal area to govern the market is the entire market, uh, the entire sphere over which it operates. Uh, and, and as it becomes more national, the uh, governance moves up to the national level. As it becomes more international, it moves to the international level. A couple of examples, think about bank capital requirements. When uh, uh, you banks operated in small towns, these were determined by the you know, uh, uh, by the town. As banks uh, had spheres of operation that extended over the entire state, these were determined in the state capital. Uh, eventually, it became the national capital. Today, bank capital requirements are determined in back rooms in Basel, where the central bankers meet and negotiate with each other and then take back from Basel what they've agreed to impose on the rest of the world. That's an example of governance steadily moving up. Um, you could also see it with, uh, uh, for example, the powers of the European Union, an attempt to bring uniformity across the countries of the European Union, which means more and more powers uh, to determine regulations are taken up to Brussels, which prompts the kind of pushback that you saw uh, with Brexit. Um, so uh, the state has grown as markets have grown. 
And uh, in the meantime, uh, the ICT revolution has also disrupted the community, first through its effects on the markets. Uh, as these communities lose jobs, social disintegration sets in. Uh, you know, marriages start breaking down. Uh, as a result, families break down. There's a lot more substance abuse which takes place and crime picks up. Uh, when the community starts breaking down, uh, as it loses the economic basis of its activity, uh, local institutions like schools also weaken, which then makes it much harder to change the economic basis of your activity because the ladder to get there is now broken and taken away. So uh, for example, technological change has increased the importance of good schooling. That was what we just discussed. But you know, as jobs leave, uh, what happens, uh, the poorly educated stay behind in those communities, while the more able, uh, the, the managerial class leaves because they don't want to see their kids sort of drawn under with the broken communities. And they go to live where the successful live. Uh, the secession of the successful increases the inequality between communities, but makes it much harder for the communities at the bottom to raise themselves up. So the community has weakened uh, because it's been dif differentially hit by economic forces, uh, which tend to favor uh, uh, better educated uh, people has been disempowered because the state has taken more and more power into the center and into the international sphere. And it is disintegrating because people uh, who can up and leave, leaving the rest behind. And that means the importance of place has, uh, you know, it's uh, it's renewed once again, because unless we fix this, uh, the political uh, difficulties we have prevent larger action. Uh, of course, the pandemic has highlighted every fault line that used to be there and, uh, and sometimes increased it. Uh, for example, as uh, Jan will talk, uh, uh, will, will describe, uh, you know, work at home uh, has, uh, has increased tremendously, uh, highlighting sort of uh, capital that was uh, unused at home. But, uh, but this is particularly the case with uh, people who perform high-valued services, while frontline, uh, you know, workers, the delivery workers, the retail workers don't have that ability because of the nature of their jobs. They do have to go in, and uh, and often they have been the ones that have been highly exposed to the virus. Um, we also see the importance of local community uh, ramping up. Uh, in many cases, people organize services for the elderly, for the disabled, for migrants who've been left out of official safety nets. Uh, certainly, uh, this happened even in uh, you know, developing countries like India. And uh, in some countries, uh, often the more authoritarian ones, the community participated in disciplining and policing distancing, enforcing quarantines on people who might otherwise violate them. And, and of course, safety nets, uh, uh, communities have been responsible in collecting resources for those who are unable to afford. Uh, at the same time, we've also seen an expansion in government. Uh, uh, national support is uh, highlighted today. The immense amount of support the federal government is giving in the United States. And of course, what this does is also create a stronger force towards centralization. Sometimes that centralization has been very ineffective and problematic in as for example, in the national lockdown that we saw in India. And, uh, and, and sometimes it has been effective uh, as for example, in the virus, uh, in, the, uh, in the vaccine search uh, prompted in the US. So, uh, you know, there is a mixed bag in terms of the effectiveness but, uh, of, uh, of central solutions. But in general, what has happened is there has been a need uh, to reevaluate uh, each of these pillars, the, uh, the markets, the state, and the community, and I'll come to that. Well, so what do we do going forward? And, and, and going forward, I think uh, there is, uh, of course, this, this uh, because of the immense role of the central government, the pandemic, uh, once again, a belief in centralization, effective centralization. At the same time, I would say the forces before the pandemic and that will emerge again post-pandemic is a pushback in the other direction. Uh, 
communities feel disempowered. Uh, if a huge amount of money is coming from the center with immense central rules, communities say, well, you know, what about us? Uh, we want to have some ability to determine our futures. And, and my broader push has been that in this world that is integrated, uh, we can get the best from markets if we don't at the same time try and integrate governance. Instead of having uh, global governance, uh, international governance, or even uh, very centralized national governance, decentralize much more and work with decentralized governance in, the, uh, in a more uh, global market. And that decentralization is possible by the very force technology that in, in the first place created the centralization. And as you decentralize down to the national governments, of course, who operate with a sense of responsibility towards the international environment, you can decentralize further to the lo local, uh, what I call inclusive localism, uh, local empowerment, but not like local exclusion, not keeping people out, not being racist locally, but being inclusive uh, and, and embracing uh, the, the idea of broader market. So uh, what are the details? Uh, let me spend a couple of minutes on this uh, and then talk about broken communities. I mean, basically, uh, we need to go back to the principle of subsidiarity. Uh, and this is as far as national governance and international governance goes, push powers down to the lowest level that can handle them effectively. You know, stop trying to get binding international treaties or harmonize when it's not needed. You don't have to have the same tax rule for every country uh, or the same, uh, you know, patent right in every country. Some variety is fine. Um, basically, companies can deal with vari variety and they've always dealt with variety. They just like uniformity, but they can certainly deal with variety. Uh, similarly, where you, uh, where you can, don't depend on centralized solutions. Uh, I mean, focusing on low interest rates to elevate left behind communities is a little optimistic. Uh, they can do little if the central problem preventing investment in those communities is crime. You need to fix the crime first before low interest rates can actually propel businesses to open up there. One example of a country which has done very well on subsidiarity is Switzerland and take the example of education in Switzerland, uh, you know, the uh, institutes of technology at the federal level, uh, they manage higher level education and the responsibility is, is the federal government. Uh, when you think about high schools, uh, they are the responsibility of the 26 cantons. And uh, uh, again, uh, they manage them well. When you think about primary schools, the responsibility is the 3,000 municipalities. Uh, each one manages its own primary school. So each level of government has its own sphere of responsibility consistent with its capabilities. And that gives a sense of empowerment, at least at my local level, I know I can influence what my kids learn at primary school. And I care a lot about that. And that makes me feel as if I have, as if I have some control. So the first is push powers down. The second is spread economic activity. And this is something that we've learned can happen during the pandemic. And Jan uh, will, will document this very well. Good jobs can be done from home far away. 45%, uh, according to uh, my colleagues at Chicago, uh, uh, in rich countries can be done at home, much less in poorer countries, which also suggests they've suffered much more during the pandemic. But uh, good jobs can be done far from home. We should emphasize this when we build back. And that's why I like the program that the Biden administration has of rolling out broadband widely, much harder in the US than closely packed Europe. But that's a good thing because it allows people across the country to work at a distance, allows good jobs to migrate to places that are further away. Uh, you know, as we build back, how many people go back to full-time work in the office and how many will go in uh, a couple of times a week and therefore can live a couple of hundred miles away from a big city? That's what we want to wait and see. 
And, and if that happens, we will have a spreading of economic activity, which actually will be much easier than earlier attempts to spread economic activity uh, uh, that, uh, that have not been successful. Uh, a second factor is technology allows access to national markets and, and therefore niche businesses can work. One niche business is, uh, is the Wengerts, an Amish family in Ohio who sell high-tech horse-drawn farm equipment. Now, high-tech horse-drawn farm equipment is a niche market. Who buys that? Well, other Amish families uh, who uh, are uh, resistant uh, to power technology. And therefore, uh, you know, to find that market, you can find them on the internet. Uh, similarly, many small producers in every country have found uh, that there are others in a global market who want their stuff. The internet allows us to do that. So uh, a bottom-up approach, including localism, I think is important to save globalization and cooperation. In the last couple of minutes, let me talk about broken communities. Um, you know, I've already talked about the uh, problem of, uh, of community empowerment. There are many communities around us in industrial countries that uh, wouldn't be out of place in the, in the third world, uh, high levels of crime, uh, 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 low levels of infrastructure, et cetera. And these can be repaired. Uh, uh, in my book, The Third Pillar, I talk about a community in Chicago, the Pilsen community, which had 21 gangs in two miles, which uh, essentially disrupted any possibility of economic activity. The first thing the community did, uh, you know, when it said uh, thus far and no more, is a group came together uh, to lead the revival effort. It was a voluntary group uh, supported by the churches. Uh, and they started by bringing down crime, by getting the community to come together to attack the sources of crime and attack the people within the community who are participating, or at least divert them from doing that. They were uh, members of the community. And, and, and uh, over time, these efforts were successful. That started bringing in businesses. That started bringing in economic activity. So we need to think about how to create that leadership in more communities, how to spread that core that will uh, essentially uh, revive these communities and getting people to go back to their communities, for example, by lowering their taxes, by forgiving college loans, may be a way you prevent the secession of the successful, uh, but also form the seed by which communities can build up. Uh, community engagement and involvement is much easier today with social media, uh, with new apps. The C-Click Fix app allows me to point to a pothole in Hyde Park and put it up on the community website. Um, infrastructure, extremely important. Uh, again, this has to be bottom up. You can't determine every community needs a library or every community needs uh, uh, thus and such uh, swimming pool. Uh, it has to be something that the community decides is important. Often, uh, you know, um, breaking down uh, some walls, uh, creating access, um, you know, making a, a abandoned uh, a piece of land a nice community park, um, you know, access to public transport. These are important facets that can actually change the working of a community. And of course, uh, some of this requires funding. The problem with central funding is of course, it comes tied with many strings, thou shalt do this and thou shalt not do that. Uh, it's important to allow much more community input and decision making uh, on how that funding can actually be repurposed. And uh, often, uh, you know, as communities survive, there's a problem of gentrification. Uh, one of the things that can prevent gentrification is for the community to own some assets of its own. And as the community develops, those assets increase in value and can support the people who are left behind. Uh, so bottom line, uh, and this is where I'll end, uh, I'm talking about localism, which are low walls around communities, give a sense of identity and empowerment, even if nothing else changes. This is important because it's a way of dealing with faceless globalization and technological change. It's a way of allowing communities to respond to that. It may also be where the jobs of the future lie uh, as much as automated 
helping others, helping the elderly, helping them deal with loneliness. That may be uh, where many jobs lie. I, I emphasize also the inclusive, that in this uh, integrated world, it's important that those walls be there, but they be low. Uh, we don't discriminate. We enforce laws against discrimination. This is where the center can play a greater role. And there are countries which do both. Sort of, uh, on the one hand, we allow more local rights. On the other hand, we keep the barriers low so that uh, trade and people can flow across. This is something, for example, the United States worked out with the Commerce Clause. And it does imply some trade-offs, but it is possible. I will stop there, hand over to Jan. Great, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Raghu, with a kind of a, a description of the last kind of 30, 40 years that's troubling, but quite a lot of optimism about the pandemic actually making dealing with that in some ways easier, which is definitely a topic we're going to come back to. Now, over to you, Jen. Thank you, Torsten, very much. Uh, let me share my screen. You can see that? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so first, thanks for the invitation to join you uh, this morning here in Chicago on uh, the afternoon uh, for many of you. The, I, I think some of my remarks will be complementary with uh, what Raghu was just discussing um, and also introduce some, some other ideas in addition. Um, of course, resilience is an idea that's been um, much at the forefront and, and deeply appreciated, of course, during the pandemic in the context of personal resilience, where people have held on through the challenges and isolation of lockdowns uh, and, and economic loss, for instance, um, and, and also economic resilience in the sense of bouncing back from the, the depths of the recession and in some cases more quickly than we thought. But the economic resilience I'll emphasize today um, it is the resilience that we don't see almost by definition um, because it's the resilience that prevented the collapse from being worse uh, than it actually was as, as severe um, as the economic downturn was around, around the globe. So this resilience is, is counter to what many models, including those that I've worked with, uh, would emphasize where the rise in uncertainty that comes with uh, such a severe crisis would in, instead of lots of activity and lots of change would instead induce waiting uh, and paralysis, the, the option value of, of waiting models. Um, instead during COVID as an example, um, the resilience has been in, in many ways astonishing, um, certainly not uniform by any means and, and I'll emphasize that. Um, but very active in, in many cases, um, but not just serendipitous. Uh, it's also associated with earlier investments that were made both in human capital and in many cases, uh, intangible capital, uh, which I'll show you in, in the data. Uh, and then the final question I wanna to turn to is one that Torsten raised in, in his opening remarks, which is, which of these actions uh, that enabled resilience during the crisis will convert? That is, which of them are not just reactions to the crisis, but will be affirmative and, and deliberate actions that will survive the crisis period itself um, and perhaps have policy implications uh, going forward, which I hope we can talk about more in, in the discussion. Um, so in my remarks, uh, these are the, the main issues I, I want to cover is this association with uncertainty and, and maybe whether we should think about that a little differently than we have in the past. Um, some examples from COVID and, and this draws on work that I've been doing um, with Paul Mizen and uh, Jonathan Haskell and then implications for the future, which is um, the main topic of, of today's gathering. Uh, I think. So first on the uh, uncertainty effect, and, and I promise not to go into the um, inner workings of, of the, the options models, but just to give you a, a sense, in the um, sketch of a, of a model that you see here, um, we, uh, 
often think about um, models of uncertainty to include real options. And I, and I wanna be a little careful here because when we have a new way of thinking about things, there's a tendency to think either that um, it's entirely new uh, and it wasn't there before, or that it's so intuitive that we knew it all along. Um, I, I think this is somewhat uh, in between. So the, the way that uh, many of us have thought about uncertainty, you know, just, just think about um, Brexit. There's a, there's a crisis, there's an associated rise in uncertainty about how that crisis will resolve. Uh, and often what we're focusing on is sort of the right-hand side of this graph, whereas the return to capital rises and we would normally uh, think about investing, firms will instead wait because this call option that's in the upper right becomes larger with uncertainty. So option values always rise with uncertainty. That call option gets larger and increases the incentive to wait. So firms spend more time waiting uh, when uncertainty rises, and, and it wouldn't be surprising to find that during a crisis. Uh, and many people have emphasized that dynamic, for example, um, during the, the process of Brexit. Um, but during an extreme event, we're not really in the right-hand side of this graph. Uh, we're in the left-hand side of the graph where the return to capital is very low. So we've had a negative extreme event and firms might instead be thinking about disinvesting, um, but that's not the only thing they can do. And, and often that's not even feasible that is scaling back during a downturn because of, um, uh, inability to, to scale back effectively during a crisis. That is, um, the, the ability to resell capital, for example, is, is often not even present when, when there's a severe crisis. So what I'm thinking about with resilience in this environment is on the left-hand side of this graph, what other options, not just this put option on your own capital, what other options are available to firms. And, and policy can think about that as well. Um, and as we go forward, this is what I wanna be thinking about is resilience around the left-hand side of the graph, not just what prevents us from moving to the right, but what are the options that government, that individuals, that communities, that firms have available to them um, when there's a severe downturn, so during extreme events. So in the, the value of resilience is that during these extreme crises, rather than waiting to invest, which might um, impose severe costs on firms, bleeding cash, losing employees, they instead at that moment have actually the greatest incentive to, und to find these new options, that is to relax the constraints, avoid the constraints, innovate around the constraints. Uh, and we've seen that actually to a, a surprisingly large extent during the pandemic. Um, I think in many ways, because it, it was so severe and once we understood the nature of the event, simply waiting what would now be 15 months for this to resolve was simply untenable. Um, so firms undertook actions, experimentation um, that they would not have undertaken during a typical recession because this was such a severe event. Um, so they were looking for ways, and I've characterized it here as bridging the event, uh, investing in, uh, I'll use WFH, work from home, uh, systematically throughout, so I don't have to write it out repeatedly. Um, taking care of cyber. When you're working from home, cyber becomes an even higher priority. Um, investments that ensure cash flows, such as you know, restaurants moving to delivery, retail moving to virtual platforms, um, rather than relying on the traditional operating models. Um, and then in that context, firms realize, of course, that they're not the only ones in that situation because an extreme event um, like a recession is not defined only by depth in duration, but also its effect across sectors. 
So if your rivals are in the same situation that you are, then of course there's a strategic game being played as well among firms. And so this pivot to new operating models becomes not only a necessity of the downturn, it becomes a necessity of survival afterwards because there's a competitive environment in which firms are, are acting. And so these are strategic options uh, as well. So the competitive imperative becomes even more important uh, once firms are committed to surviving the, the extreme event that they face. Um, and then, of course, having undertaken these new uh, business models, these new ways of interacting with customers, uh, employees interacting with each other, some of what began as bridges become uh, ways of life. And, and that's part of what we want to talk about today. So with we can think of the, the context of work from home in, the, in this broader uh, setting where what firms are doing is experimenting uh, along with their labor force, along with their customers to implement new options, which may actually change uh, how they do business. So I'm gonna talk um, about some, some work on, on work, <laughs> on working from home that, that I've done with uh, Paul and Jonathan that I mentioned uh, at the beginning. And, and this chart shows data from the decision makers panel uh, from the UK, which shows the, the share of workers working from home, furloughed and working on premises. Small group in, in orange here is the people who were unable to work, but the vast majority across industries you see um, are uh, furloughed in blue, uh, and that dominates accommodation and food, for example. Uh, working from home, which is in, in gold. And there you see um, the high value added services that Ragu mentioned um, have the vast majority and, and the sort of uh, weight, weight of, of gravity in, in work from home is in high value added services. But the, this is an aggregate phenomenon, which is, which is really quite new. Um, and that this, this, pivot to working from home happened at such a scale that it moved the macro economy. And, and that's not something that we've seen in previous crises and, and we wanna measure the impact. So a number to keep in mind is this is, I think the, the best data we have across countries, um, at about 35%, uh, and this is in May, 2020, about 35% across all firms uh, of employees were working from home, and that roughly matches the share that was furloughed. Uh, and, and that, you know, in the, this is in May, this is the, the first months of the crisis, that is really a monumental shift in the, in the mode of, of working across industries. So I mentioned that this was large enough to have a macro impact, and this chart shows the result of some of the calculations we've done on how large that impact really is. So um, we've done this uh, calculation across seven advanced economies and I'll emphasize the UK data and then I'll show the US data momentarily. So in the UK data, the blue line shows our calculation of what output would have been without labor working at home and capital working at home. Um, and this is in uh, Q2, which is the, the depth of the crisis, of course. And so this is the result of a growth accounting exercise for those of you interested in the methodology. Uh, we've written it up in a paper I'm, I'm happy to share. And, and what you see is that there's, um, for the UK, without the pivot to work from home, the decline in GDP in the second quarter would have been 33%. Uh, whereas in actuality, it was 21%. And this is just quarter to quarter, this is not annualized. So the, the, the data here demonstrate first how severe the crisis was for one thing, uh, and secondly, how much worse the collapse might have been uh, had we not had the capacity, which is not serendipity, as I mentioned, that not had the capacity 
um, to shift to working from home. Um, so part of that relied on labor and that's been much reported, but what we emphasize also is that this required capital. The employees going home, you know, if, if we all come home and, and work from our offices, um, it, it, there's not much use to it. You know, in, in fact, the question that prompted us working on this was, uh, and you know, the people in this audience probably understand this uh, comparison more than my students do. Imagine this crisis had happened 20 years ago. Imagine it had happened in the mid 1990s when we had dial up connections and, and analog phones. Um, what we have instead is, is what we'll call potential capital, which is capital not previously utilized for business purposes, but made available by the technologies that um, are currently available to, to many, but not all of us. So we wanna think about what capital they used. So we'll do this with the growth, growth accounting exercise and think about what would happen when we distribute labor back out of factories, stores, and offices so that labor can be not only remote from each other, but also remote from customers, which turned out to be a crucial form of, of isolation. Um, and the ability to work, and you know, this pivot happened in a matter of weeks, depended on, on capital that was immediately available. That is, it was already there to generate a new workplace. Um, this is not to dwell on, uh, you know, thousands of years of, of history, um, but this is not actually a new idea. Um, the chart in the, or the, the picture in the upper left shows um, textile production in, in China in the, in the seventh century. And in the uh, right-hand side is pre-industrial revolution England, of course, where there's artisanal production of textiles, very nice history book on this, um, at home. And the factory was essentially um, in, in residences. And then the, the move of the industrial resolution was to centralize the workplace and to bring workers together with large scale capital and, and centralized production. Um, and then we've spent, you know, the, the last several decades and especially the last year decentralizing that again and moving um, centralized capital in the workplace, but decentralizing labor and other forms of capital, especially intangible capital, um, back out of the workplace again. So just to, to sketch the macro capital, I have lots of tables uh, on this, but just to give you a, a few selections, um, the macro impact of work from home for the UK, this potential capital contributed 3% um, to GDP in the second quarter of 2020 directly. Uh, and then when you add in labor, it's 8.7%. So um, on average across countries, it's about 10% of GDP. Uh, which is, you know, when you think about rates of productivity growth, 10% of GDP is a, is a massive contribution. Um, if instead one ignores these home inputs, how do you explain these high levels of output? Well, instead you would have to assume that productivity rose uh, 11 or 12% across countries during a crisis, which sort of strains uh, plausibility. The, the data that I sh just showed you for the, the UK, I'll just show you for the US and, and the UK, the total work production output from work went down almost 33% in the second quarter. And that was partially offset. You see in the, the red is the work from home. So this is the 8.7% offset. So not a complete offset, obviously, there was still a collapse in output, but working from home uh, improved the situation dramatically. And then in the third quarter, there was a bit of a reversal. And then in the fourth quarter, you see it flattening out. You see the same pattern across all of the countries we look at. In the US, the decline in output from work in the second quarter was 17.4%. You see on the, the left in the yellow, offset about 50% was offset by work from home, uh, both labor and capital in the US. And you see the same pattern uh, playing out over time. 
So what is this potential capital? Um, I said it's it's the working from home is not new historically. It's there's also a counterpart in modern economies. Um, this is essentially the business model of Uber and Airbnb of putting personal capital to business use. Um, but it's not just having you know the car, the vacation home, or the office in your house. You, for this to be effective and productive, one also needs the connectivity, um, the sort of platform that we're using today. So we're not just sitting in our offices working in, in isolation. Uh, we have these digital complements and conferencing that recreate uh, a workplace, um, however imperfectly, but they're, they're getting better and, and we're learning. Um, so not surprisingly, given the importance of the connectivity, um, this greater working from home, which is on the, the vertical axis, um, is highly correlated with investments in intangible capital. Uh, and you see the, the high value added services in the upper right, information and communications, professional and scientific um, occupations have the highest level of work from home. And those industries also have the highest investment in intangible capital. Um, accommodation and food, of course, pins down the, the other end of the distribution. So how does this play into to structural change? Um, well, work from home happens for um, two main reasons we find um, in, the, in the work we've done so far. One is simply the cost of working on premises. And as the cost of working on premises reverses and, and hopefully as the pandemic recedes, we will surely see more people returning to working um, at their workplace um, because it will simply be less costly and, and more desirable to do so. But on the other hand, this role of initial ICT, so the, the ICT measures that I showed you are the pre-pandemic ICT. So it was the capacity that was already in place. And what we learned during the pandemic was that this capacity was already there and perhaps is the large shock, this, this massive pandemic shock that solved the collective action problem of working from home. Um, so we could have worked from home before, but being the first person, being the only person working from home is not very effective. So the pandemic sort of solved this collection, collective action problem, forced learning, and creates the, the potential to continue with working from home. Uh, surveys of employees, I've seen this both for the UK and the US, show a preference for two to three days. Um, I've seen this both at micro level individual firms uh, and also broad surveys, um, but surveys of employers um, show much less uh, enthusiasm, still you know, a, a structural change, but a smaller one. Um, compensation for this, I think is an extremely interesting question, um, unresolved, because there are both costs and benefits of working from home. Employees are essentially providing their own capital um, and both the technology and, and the space, um, but they also benefit from foregone commuting. Uh, so how the compensation and, and the benefits of working from home, if they are there, um, are allocated between employers and employees uh, remains an open question. Obviously the distribution is uneven. Uh, this resilience was not uh, uniformly distributed, correlated with human capital and, and these ICT investments. Um, there's also surveys the employers show more openness to work from home for high income employees and especially in uh, large urban areas where commuting, for example, is, is a greater cost. So to wrap up, um, on productivity, um, so my, my colleague, Bob Gordon, has been very skeptical of the um, benefits of the internet uh, for productivity. And, and I think so far the evidence has borne him out. Um, but perhaps the, the pandemic was the moment uh, for the internet to, to show its worth. And it's not such a disappointment after all, uh, and provided greater um, synergies with intangible capital. Um, but for policy and, and looking forward, I mean, one thing to bear in mind is, is that 
exercises in business resilience, which as I, I note below, came from both a regulatory push in, in regulated industries and a risk management push from the private sector really paved the way for working from home. You know, many, many firms were prepared to work from home because of their preparation for natural disasters. They weren't prepared to do it for a year, but they had, they could flip, they had a, a switch to flip. Um, and but there's been an odd form of insurance going on during the pandemic because of work from home, which is essentially that employees who work from home provided insurance to their firms and the rest of the economy by taking on the responsibility of working from home. So the, the social insurance didn't come from the center to these workers. These workers actually insured the rest of the economy. So it's, a, it's an odd reversal um, of the typical insurance models. But that only, I think, um, reinforces the workers who were not insured. So in the UK, the furlough program, I think, provided some of that insurance. Uh, in the US, there were expansions of unemployment insurance. There's also been discussions of workers who were employed, but still quite exposed to the crisis, especially frontline workers, workers in health services uh, and so on, who um, were, had very limited social insurance uh, available to them. So let me stop there so we can have a, an open discussion of these issues, um, which I'm looking forward to. Great, thanks very much. Um, Jan, there's lots of great food for uh, thought in there and some different takes. Everyone's talking about the work from home revolution, but you've provided quite a few new ways into that question, which is really valuable for um, uh, the discussion, right? In terms of um, how we structure this, I thought we might briefly have a bit of a conversation about which of the uh, changes that have happened so far look more structural and which in the end we're all going to look back in a few years and think we're just flashes in the pan and then I think given that you both honed in on the lasting impact of uh, the working from home change in Raghu's case in terms of its effect on the localization versus nationalization national picture pitch and then Jan from a broader perspective on what it does to um, how much capital there is in the economy for example uh, so let's maybe focus on that because we've got about 25 minutes but to kick us off I think there's a there's a poll question up on Slido which some of you have been voting on while we were talking uh, and I think we're going to bring that up to um, show you all just to give you a chance the um, uh, and so, oh hello we've lost it where's it gone there we go. The um, oh. anyway, can we hold it? There we go. Okay, we're inconsistent. Right. So this is just saying there's, there's a lot of big changes happening during this crisis because it's a pandemic, and all, all economic crises drive economic change, but behavioural change is unusually high in this crisis for all the obvious reasons about. Uh, it's a health crisis causing it rather than an economic cause per se. The, um, the two big ones there are, are the ones that get most of the discussion. So working from home, which is what we're focusing on here, maybe. But the move to online shopping is also very significant. In the UK, which was already a leader in the percentage of shopping taking place online, we've seen a very big step change. I'd say you're, none, of you, none of you think that we're going to permanently be spending more on goods than we are on services which, I mean, the switch towards spending on goods and away from services is huge in this crisis. So, the, um, but I think that, that does match the, that does match your pessimism about that continuing does match the, um, the, the historical trend, which is away from spending on goods and towards spending on services. So maybe that is uh, right. Jan, does that vaguely match your expectations of which trends are going to be lasting and which are going to be disappearing? Um, it, it does for exactly the reason that, that you just alluded to, which is that um, they match, they exacerbate trends that were already in, in place. Um, and, and I think that's quite important. So for online shopping, you know, the business failures were lower than expected uh, during the crisis, but the failures that we saw were in retail. Um, why? Because of the existing weakness in, in retail and, and shift toward uh, online platforms, which have many cost ad advantages already. Um, on work from home, interestingly, you know, it, 
there wasn't a trend toward work from home. I mean, the mild increases in, in work from home pre-crisis, but I think the trend that's exacerbated there is really a generational shift toward um, more sort of private benefits from, from working. I mean, when I, when I talk to young people, they're extremely enthusiastic about working from home because it gives them choice. Uh, it gives them flexibility, you know, and, the, and this was, uh, a generation that was raised on being able to choose exactly which show they want to watch at exactly which time and, and having much more choice and autonomy. And, and work from home goes in that same direction. And from an employer's mm -hmm. perspective, you know, there, there's costs of work from home, uh, of course, but you know, there's been a long running trend, maybe more in the US than in the UK of, um, sort of gigifying work. Um, and, and the things I'm thinking of are, you know, the loss of defined benefit pensions, uh, moving toward defined contribution uh, pension programs. So just sort of um, making work more transactional. Uh, and, like and a, loose, think, a loosening of the relationship, basically. Yeah, so. a, a, a lessening of match capital. Um, between firms and workers. So this actually worries me. So I think there's a rush toward work from home, but the loss of that um, connection, and in some cases a community uh, around work, I, I think potentially undermines and, and we may be a little sorry that, that we rush to, to let it go. But that's, that's really interesting because you're, so you're, as you say, the cultural pressure, which may be, more from younger employees because they're used to that choice. In some ways, though, that kind of, I don't want to sound like a kind of, um, uh, this is this is a slightly patronizing, are they definitely sure it's in their interest? Because stepping back, who benefits most from the office? It, in the end, it's people that are learning, that have networks to build. Like, I kind of think exactly. it should be, it should, it should be us. It should be the middle-aged uh, who've like, who should benefit most from work from home. Whereas if I was if I was back in the youth, I would be wanting to be back in the office because I don't know it. I don't know enough yet. I don't know enough people. But Raggy, what do you think on this? I, I, I think that's absolutely right. I, I think as uh, you know, we move from short periods of work at home to longer periods, these kinds of issues come to the fore, right? How do we build culture? How do we build yeah. uh, camaraderie amongst people? And it's very hard to do it on Zoom. Uh, it's very <laughs> hard to do those informal chats. Uh, and, you know, uh, the... Uh, I'm going to say something silly. I mean, it's something as simple as as personal interaction, the pheromones, the the way people speak, the uh, uh, you know, the uh, th that that's still important. Uh, and 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 I think uh, this particularly hurts. Uh, you know, uh, I think there will be gender issues which will crop up. It'll be easier for the men to enter office, there'll be more compulsion on women to stay at home because unfortunately they still take uh, have a greater uh, sort of um, realized responsibility for taking care of kids that will lead to unequal, uh, even more inequality in terms of progression. I mean, we need to take care of all this and this will come very quickly to the fore as companies start putting. Uh, so so uh, my sense is, I think Jan is absolutely right. This has broken the barriers to, uh, I mean, earlier we couldn't have Zoom meetings because you were disrespecting the other person by saying, let's talk instead of, you know, traveling 2000 miles to visit them. But now you have to ask the question, well, is that enough? I'm getting 80% of the way, but if I actually sort of spend a day there, maybe I get to see people that I wouldn't have ordinarily thought of interacting with. Uh, and, and I think similarly uh, in the work from home, all the things that we're missing out, we'll have to find ways of recreating them. I think we need to take advantage of this technology. And it may be that the entire office shuts down for two days a week, so everybody comes back together for those remaining three days. Or it may be that you know you keep shifting. Who, sh who, who firms will have to figure this out? Yeah, and that in the end, I mean, this is a really boring answer, but in the end, different firms are going to respond in different ways because different ways, different kinds of activities are going to be more suited to. Like, if I think about you know research institutes like ours, there's a huge amount of productivity which comes from people interacting on questions helping each other out on their research and we've definitely suffered from that from the last year but 
it does open up people lots of different lifestyle options, as you say. Um, Jen, let's just take one more question, one, a question from the audience. Uh, maybe, Raghu, you can start on this one, which is just leave work from home because we're going to come back to that in a second. But some of the changes that maybe... I'll, so let's think about the retail sector. So if you look at the, the, the high street retail sector has seen in the US big falls in employment and in the UK big furlough rates... Uh, but we've seen a huge increase in distribution jobs. That's a pre-crisis trend that, as Jan says, has been massively accelerated. Do we think, do we think that actually we may actually see a shrinking because, because it may have overshot what is the, where we are in the kind of long-term structural trend away from high street retail and towards that we might actually see for the first time in probably at least 20 years a fall in kind of distribution and logistics employment after the crisis as we go somewhat back towards the north i.e we've now got too many delivery drivers right now and some of those will go back to the jobs they were doing pre-crisis or do we think the, the speeding up of the trend is just enough to keep going basically well it, it's obviously hard to say uh i, I think the I, I think for sure uh some of what we've seen for example in the restaurant business more of them have automated the process of takeout and uh, that's, that's here to stay. Uh, a number of restaurants will be half and half. There will be a takeout uh, sort of window and there will be the permanent seating uh, uh, or, or the normal seating. And, and this, is, this is here to stay. A lot of people will take advantage of it. Uh, I think in the, in the retail industry, I mean, uh, look, I, we're, we're all based on personal experiences. Uh, I, I've been trying to buy, buy some trousers. And yesterday I happened to be at a shopping mall for the first time in a year and a half. I went into the shop and I tried the three, three versions that I was contemplating. And, you know, I could make a decision in three minutes because I actually wore them. Yeah. If I did it online, I would buy it, send it back, buy it, send it okay. back, buy it. Yeah. Uh, so, so there are some advantages of physical presence. Now, to some extent, what this means is we will see a melding, right? We will see a mix which allows us to, on, on the one hand, shop online, but on the other hand, have some experience of actually trying out the good without having to go back and forth on sending it back, because that obviously those returns are a big productivity loss for the economy. So how do we do it in an effective way? I think the, the point to take away is the pandemic has allowed for experimentation, in fact, forced experimentation, and how we shape up determines a lot on, uh, uh, you know, uh, obviously the point you earlier made, which is different industries will go different ways on this, but it has broken uh, and, and this is important in the rollout of technology, as, as, as Jan will attest, that uh, new ways of doing business to take advantage of the benefits of the technology are so important to see the productivity effects. This was what we saw with uh, electric power. This is what we're now hopefully going to see with, uh, with some of this communications technology. Jan, why don't we come to you on that? Because as you were talking, uh, you, you, and I, I'm going to come in a bit to some of the challenges from the pandemic. So we are slightly on the silver linings here, but the um, mm -hmm. but the way you the way you you clearly set out the kind of the 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 jump to new ways of working that the pandemic forced on firms. It's a bit so the case study that's always used in the UK for this discussion is when there is a tube strike in London, if it lasts for kind of ten days, so nobody can get the tube in the usual way to work. After the strike finishes, I can't remember what the number it is, but like 15% of people have found a new quicker way to get to work because they were forced to try something new out. So how, I'm not saying that the pandemic is like a tube strike, obviously, but, the, um, but how much do you think that is going to be the main sort? It's not necessarily the work from home per se. It's just lots of companies have been forced to try new things in a very short space of time. And we, it would have taken us decades to get that experimentation. Now, I think to the extent we're seeing some increases in uh, productivity, it's precisely the, the mechanism that you're mentioning is that there, there was a, a forced innovation and experimentation, and then you can pick and choose what's most effective. Um, as as Ragu, though, though I want to be careful about one thing is when you look at the productivity numbers, part of what you're seeing is a composition effect. Um, so the in the US are estimating, you know, not even taking into account potential capital about a 3% productivity increase. And um, the one pushback I've seen on that, again, from Bob Gordon, is that that's entirely a composition effect because 
the industries that are active are the most productive ones. The industries that have, to a large extent, closed have lower productivity. So be careful of, of productivity numbers now. But you know at, what we're talking about is as we return um, to work, we will benefit from this experimentation. And as, as Regu was talking, I was thinking of uh, one example and, and one, I guess an example is one piece of data, but uh, a, 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 um, uh, a sur some survey evidence. So the, the example is in, in restaurants, you know, even if they're doing less delivery, what they've also automated to some extent, you know, you have um, order taking devices now um, that are productivity enhancing and also um, health enhancing, right? Because you, you have fewer people uh, interacting physically. So the, the automation um, has, has also, will also increase productivity even when we go back to uh, what seem like familiar ways of doing business. Yeah. In the CFO survey that um, Campbell Harvey runs out of, out of Duke University, um, the, the firms that are implementing work from home can, are, are investing, um, but in technologies, you know, not in physical capital, they're, they're investing in these complementary technologies. For firms that did not implement work from home, probably, you know, manufacturing firms that, that don't have that capability, they're investing in automation, uh, and which I think is a, a interesting pivot to look for as, as we go forward. We often see that during downturns uh, and this is an extreme case. The, the example you give on uh, restaurants is really interesting because but in the UK, we've been fast increasing our minimum wage in recent years since 2015, like really quite, really quite quickly. And one of the, uh, the, the minimum wage literature tells us that one of the ways firms will respond to that over time is by looking for labor saving choices like the one you're mentioning, which is, you know, we, you do see automated check in at some hotels that is largely driven in the UK by the minimum wage rising. Restaurants, I have to say, in the UK have been very resistant to experimenting with new ways and even quite large price pressures didn't drive the change you're talking about pre-pandemic. Yeah. Whereas the health pressure, the re basically the regulatory pressure immediately led to something happening that the price pressure might have done eventually have got us to basically. Because UK restaurants employ a lot of staff compared to American and French restaurants. They, anyway, they, um, right, now, now this, this conversation is getting dangerously perky. So I think what we should do is, uh, as in there's a danger that we're, like, we're focused on all the silver linings. So I thought we should just take some of the challenges to the silver linings you're setting out. Uh, so Raghu, why don't we go uh, first to you and let's do this by bringing up a poll, the, the second poll for the audience to vote on as well, which is in um, s some of your argument, which is, we want to see a move back towards local control where possible and that the pandemic might help that as you say because of greater choice about location for example so if we, if we bring up the the poll what it's asking people is wh where do we think the balance of the change comes from on this localization is it is it that actually more choice of working from lo location for those able to work from home which is a bit under half the population they've got more options or, or could it be that the actual the experience of looking at national government to ensure us against crisis like this actually pushes the other way? It's more centralization because people decide I want a national government looking after my health and also providing me with economic insurance. So the furlough scheme in the UK or much more generous unemployment insurance in America, uh, is that the dominant takeaway? And actually, it might reinforce people's preference for national uh, so why, don't you take, why don't you give us your view on that first, Reggie, and then there's one question from the public uh, yeah. on a similar related issue. But if you go first. Well, first, I think uh, uh, both are possible. Uh, it certainly is the case that the enormous spending by national governments, uh, I, I don't know how much that makes people feel more benevolent towards national government, but it certainly makes it more dependent on national government. And, and, and that would cause more centralization. We already see in the United States, the US, uh, you know, the federal government is telling states, you cannot spend this money by doing thus and such because it was meant for this other purpose. And if you don't want 
to do this other person first give it back to us so it is the centralization of uh, of policy in many ways again there are places where centralization is useful there are cent- places where centralization is not for example in the current proposals the biden administration wants to make community college free for every uh, you know throughout the united states is that the best way of using education resources uh are there better ways uh should it be up to areas to figure out do i want to put more money into primary or into early childhood or do i want to put more money into community colleges i mean this is an example of situations where uh more local decision making would perhaps be more effective uh in part because there is no national civil service which runs the community colleges why centralize that decision uh, on on this this much spending so uh, uh i think another issue which will come up which hasn't come up yet is with the centralization there's also an issue of power right uh where does power go in a country and to what extent are there checks and balances of course now with the biden administration there's a sense that oh yes we have got benevolent government back of course depending on which side of the aisle you sit on but uh what if there's a change once more uh what are the checks and balances against central power this is an issue in many industrial countries and as the role of the government increases one of the checks and balances is decentralized government the local government the state government is a check on the federal government and and we've seen you know in the us during the uh, trump administration there were sanctuary cities i presume something similar will emerge now this is not to say that the idealists will undercut uh, you know different levels of government warring with each other but checks and balances are important and this is why i think that's an additional value for decentralization that's great and that's again it's always good the, the, the argument for localization can get stripped back into a narrow kind of utilitarian local decision we better decisions but you're really elevating the argument to being it's desirable for a host of other reasons about the feeling of what it likes is to live there and as you're now adding the kind of the checks and balances argument which is a longer term utilitarian argument against for there's there's a question from Tim uh, which we'll bring up on the screen for you Reggie which is basically saying how much do we think the the centralization of skilled workers or the successful as you call the succession of the successful you talk about to living in cities is a really hot topic in the UK partly because of the London debate but not just because of the London debate the um that we have a towns versus cities debate even though we're tiny compared to we don't have the midwest to uh, think about in the UK obviously but the um how much is it to do with the economics and therefore would be alleviated by the work from home dynamic which re- re- if that reduces agglomeration pressures within the commercial world but how much is it to do with lifestyle choices people want to live around other grad- graduates are going to where other graduates are not just for agglomeration reasons they're going for lifestyle reasons i th- i think uh, absolutely i mean that's that's why we saw the big cities burgeoning why uh, new york was such a nice place and london is such a fantastic place to live in uh and i think what we have is a little bit of an offset to that right so so why don't i want to live in peoria uh because there's not much you know fun stuff to do but there aren't other people also uh who do my kind of work and and as we get more of those people distributed around of course the big i mean this is uh, uh you know these issues uh the the kind of uh, network effect i i go where other people are uh it could happen in any which way and and to some extent the agglomeration economies in cities are why people have gone to the cities there are other people like them they can learn from each other and so on but what i'm saying is now we have the possibility of that happening in the smaller towns and of course as we other lifestyle issues come in do i really want a long commute do i want to uh, consume the energy involved in a long commute and commute uh, contribute to global warming you could have people thinking the other way and saying okay maybe i live in a small town and i don't really go into uh you know this difficult one hour commute in the city and it's it's healthier i breathe better air it's cheaper prices yeah. do a lot prices are very useful in uh, in making people embrace these lifestyles they will and you're making it sound more tempting as we go uh uh through now jan let's let's take the the challenge to your silver some of your silver lining so 
this is an unfair caricature of your presentation, but one way of taking it is we've just discovered that there's a lot of extra capital out there. OK, we've got we suddenly all, all of all of this housing stock turns out to actually be productive capital rather than just housing services in physical form. And that's boosted our productivity in the short term when enabled by the uh, Internet revolution. And I really like your point about the Internet turns out to have provided resilience, even if it didn't provide us with output. That's a really great way of um, thinking about it. But, uh, the flip side is what happens to all the old capital because are we is it just a tra is it really additional capital or is it that we then end up leaving other capital less heavily utilized and so the effective capital stock doesn't grow by as much we, we can't just add together all the bedrooms basically what do you what do you think right. um that's let me address that question but just give a, a coda to the last discussion about people moving um out of cities i think that's there's surely potential for that, but that doesn't address the left behind places that the, the issue that Raghu raised earlier, I think fundamentally, because the, the places people are moving to have broadband and good schools. And so they're moving to, you know, Asheville, North Carolina, you know, but yeah. they're not moving to places that are truly left behind that, you know, are the of place-based, the, the recipients of place-based policies that, that we're truly worried about. So we, I think we have to be a little, I'm, I'm pulling back from the, um, the perky uh, <laughs> version here because I'm a, I'm a little worried about that, that interpretation. Um, and then on the, on the capital, there's, there's a reallocation effect, which is what you're talking about. Um, and the concern, and, and we see this in, in commercial real estate, is that the downtown areas will be less used. We were seeing this already with uh, retail. Uh, so again, it's a, it's a continuing trend and, and might be exacerbated. Though, you know, it, it's, those uh, facilities can be repurposed. You know, we've seen many, you know, factories turned into lofts. You know, there, there are um, price effects that, that will um, facilitate repurposing capital for, for other uses. Uh, but I think what we have seen is this realization that for physical capital, there, there is much more than, than we thought. You know, the, in automobiles and vacation homes, you know, there, there is this uh, capacity, the, the famous story that autos are used 5% of, of the time, yeah. um, Uber and, and Lyft, that, that's, their, um, that's their capital stock now. Um, so, you know, I'm, there will like, to, especially to the extent there's work from home, there will be repurposing. And, you know, if people are living in West Virginia and commuting to DC, there'll be demand for long-term stay uh, hotels in DC so that when people drive the hundred miles to work and stay for two days or three yeah. days, they have somewhere to stay without having a house, right? So, so there will be, you know, reallocation uh, and that's always disruptive, but um, that's, the, that's what innovation foments is uh, reallocation of capital. All about so Jan, when is my employer gonna pay me rent for my bedroom? <laughs> from which I do my Zoom calls. <laughs> no, there, I, I agree. There's some employers have chipped in for at least for the technology. Um, they're not paying rent yet, um, but the technology is a start because they want people to have a good kit, uh, and often the same across employees. So that's the kit, the bit, the kit, the kit bit makes sense, doesn't it? It's yeah. when you have organizations trying to go to full virtual, you do at some point think. The, the, the company's making a very large cost saving. Uh, the, um, the, uh, and that is... Very large. Uh, yeah, the point yeah. you made about the power will in the end determine where the benefits of that fall mm -hmm. is a really good one. Now, we're obviously over time. So I thought, why don't we wrap up with one last question, which I'll, be, I'll give to each of you to, to give us your closing remarks, which is a totally impossible one, which is asking you to think forward to 10 years and you're giving the State of the Union or State of the Nation address at some country or other. What do you think, looking back, on the economic side, not on the social side, but on the economic side, we will see as the lasting economic effect because we haven't really got into here into unemployment, higher debt for 
uh, governments. Like, what's, what are people going to look back and think that was the actual? Lots of things happened, but the big lasting change from this crisis was X, which is obviously a really unfair question to answer. But, Raghu, do you want to? Kick us off with your closing remarks. Yeah, uh, what we haven't talked about really is the inequality between countries. We've talked about inequality yes. within countries. There's been as much damage done to inequality between countries by this crisis, if not more. Uh, you know, poorer countries, uh, Latin America, South Asia, hit by the pandemic in devastating second and third waves. But with very little support, we haven't had the massive expansion in, in government activity. And as you know, with all the discussion about vaccines, uh, they're sort of uh, haven't prepared well enough and are looking to vaccinate their populations by 2022 or 2023 unless we change. And I fear that the story, uh, if we're not careful over the next 10 years, will be what a disaster it was for global security, global conflict, because the uh, you know uh, uh, in a, in a, the poverty uh, frustration is the source of uh, of conflict, and and we could have a whole lot more of that if we're not careful. So I would say what I would love to hear is that this changed uh, the environment for global cooperation, and as countries, uh, industrial countries, focused on remedying the internal sort of inequalities and the internal weaknesses, they also spared a thought to remedying the international uh, differences. And, and, and uh, as a result, we came out of this era with a much stronger sense of, uh, of the need as well as uh, new institutions to affect the global cooperation. And, and that set the stage for dealing with much bigger problems like climate change. So that's that's my optimistic that's, rendering. That is a definitely an optimistic rendering. I hope that turns out to be right. The, the, the vaccine lessons so far aren't massively pointing in that direction, but you can see people at least getting, you can see embarrassment at least setting in on vaccines, even if not action, which is something. Jan, and last word to you. Yeah, um, I would say rethinking public health as an economic uh, issue. So, you know, it's, it's become abundantly clear, um, several of, of Regu's points actually about the importance of both uh, local capabilities as well as uh, national and international leadership uh, on public health. And that leaving that, you know, we've seen uh, in the, I mean, the US and the UK have really quite opposite approaches um, to, to public health and leaving that as an, uh, employer provided, solely provo uh, individual provided benefit or employer provided benefit. We've really seen the, the limitations of that and relying on local public health authorities for, for all um, uh, public provision. Uh, we've really seen the, the weaknesses of that approach. So um, I think the, the focus on public health I, I worry that it will fade too quickly if we have success with vaccines, um, but we should remember where this crisis started uh, and that the, the way this began was not um, necessarily isolated. Uh, and having that was, the US is having a big debate about infrastructure. Um, public health is a cornerstone of that infrastructure and, um, we now appreciate the interaction with the economy and we should have appreciated it all along as a, um, social, um, a social priority uh, in the country. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Jan, is a good plea to focus on resilience, not just from the internet, but from all kinds of things that strengthen our societies and our economies. It's a good place to end. So, I mean, look, I think it's quite hard for any human not to be pretty heavily personally changed by the last uh, 18 months, but... What we're touching on here is how much of the change is lasting for our economies and societies. I hope everyone found the thoughts of our panel very useful today. Thank you for joining us, everyone. And thank you to Jan and to Raghu for their thoughts and their time from across the Atlantic. The, um, you could have both been in the same room, given how close you are to each other in the... Uh, but no, that was great. And thanks. And remember to join the next seminar in this series on uh, Tuesday on fiscal policy, because there's a lot of it around and a lot of it to come for the foreseeable future. So have a good day, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you.